Hello class, Professor Dwight Hughes covering Chapter 5 of the CCNA 4 Curriculum, Single Area OSPF. We're going to introduce OSPF and look at Single Area OSPF implementations, then we'll discuss troubleshooting Single Area OSPF implementations, and then wrap up with a summary. Remember that Chapter 5 and Chapter 6 both deal with OSPF, so next week in Chapter 6 we'll be looking a lot more detailed at multi-area OSPF, and multi-area is really the um, feature of OSPF that is most sought after. So this week we'll restrict ourselves to only looking at single area. These are the different objectives that we hope to accomplish in this lecture when we're done. Okay, let's talk about some advanced single area OSPF configurations. And you'll recall you were introduced to OSPF back in the CCNA 2 course. Routing versus switching, right? Switches, link aggregation, LAN redundancy, and wireless are all technologies that provide or enhance user access to network resources. Scalable networks also require optimal reachability between sites. This is where our layer three uh, switches and our routers operate in the distribution and core layers. So this is where we'll have our routing is at layer three and of course switching uh, and link aggregation and LAN redundancy and wireless are all part of layer two. So OSPF is a routing protocol, so it will take place in routers and layer three switches. Static routing is a commonly used and fairly straightforward way to tell a router where destinations are. In the topology diagram we see here, we would need a static route anyways to tell the routers where the internet is. Dynamic routing doesn't have the ability to identify networks beyond the protocol. So it can identify any networks within, say OSPF, if you're doing OSPF dynamic routing, any of the OSPF networks can be identified, but the internet is not an OSPF network, so it would not be identified. So you'd have to identify it statically. We use a special static route for this called the default route. So we would go into router two and we would create a default route, sometimes called a quad zero route, and we would point that out the interface or towards the next top IP of our ISP router to indicate that unknown traffic should be sent there. We can use the redistribute command within OSPF to pick up that default route and redistribute it to router one, or we could uh, statically create another default route in router one pointing over to router two. So router one could be instructed with a default route, send all unknown traffic to router two, and then router two could be instructed with a default route to send all unknown traffic out to the ISP. It's preferred that you would use the redistribute um, default or redistribute static commands with the OSPF routing protocol to handle that automatically. That way you'd only have to provide the static route in one of your routers. In a dynamic routing scenario, you go into router one and you would type, uh, you know, router OSPF one, and then you would type network and start listing your networks. And you would just list the directly connected networks. So router one has three directly connected networks and you would list each of those. And then you would go into router two and do the same thing. And you would be listing three directly connected networks. You would not be providing OSPF network information about the link to the internet because that's going to be a non-OSPF network and you're going to handle that with a static route. Configuring OSPF is a little different than configuring RIP or EIGRP, which we did mostly in our CCNA2 course. You'll see that like EIGRP, you need to have a router ID. You'll want to um, set a router ID, otherwise OSPF will default to use the highest numbered um, loopback interface you have with an IPv4 address. And if you don't have a loopback interface with an IPv4 address, it will default back to using the highest numbered 
real interface with an IPv4 address. And if you don't have a real interface with an IPv4 address, the OSP of routing protocol will fail. So it's very important to set a router ID that's the preferred way to ensure that your OSPF router has a router ID. Each OSPF router needs a unique router ID. This again can just be an IPv4 address or in the ex example here we could put 1000 or 1111 and 2000 or 2222 and 3 and 4 and so on. And the router ID is related to some elections that the OSP of routing protocol will have. We have then a process ID where it says router OSPF 10. 10 is the process ID or sometimes called the PID. And that's just a arbitrary number. Usually I just put one there. It is not like an EIGRP. That's an autonomous system number with EIGRP. So if the command was router EIGRP 10, that would be significant and it would need to match on all of your EIGRP routers. So in this case, because it's OSPF, I could do router OSPF 10 on router 1 and router OSPF 1 on router 2 and it, it would still work just fine. So it's just an arbitrary number and it's recommended you just use 1. Then you set your router ID and then you can set your auto cost reference bandwidth and the reason we changed that bandwidth if you recall from CCNA2 is because OSPF is a little bit of an older routing protocol its cost metric is bandwidth and it compares different bandwidth links to find the best bandwidth path through your network. It however fails after one gigabit because uh, it's older the maximum bandwidth that was envisioned at the time was one gigabit so now we have 10 gigabit and higher so we need to change the auto cost reference so it can accommodate the higher bandwidths that, that we are likely to see on a modern network. So that's a command you'll want to make sure you put into your OSPF routing protocol so it's adapted to new higher bandwidth. And then you just list each directly connected network. And in the case of this chapter, we'll assign them all to area zero. You have to have an area. There's no concept of routes not being in an area. They're always part of an area. And in this chapter, they'll all be part of area zero. You must have an area zero. The other areas are optional and they can be any made up number you like, like area 50 or 100 or two or three. You just make up those numbers. But area zero is um, a default area and it is called the backbone area. Notice we've also typed passive interface. Passive interface, just like we learned with EIGRP and with RIP, is a way that we can prevent routing table updates from being sent out a particular interface. Notice we're still advertising that interface, that network using the network command, but because the GIG00 interface on both of these routers does not point towards other routers, instead it points towards printers and PCs and devices like that, there's no reason for them to get a routing table update. So passive interface stops those routing table updates from being emitted on those interfaces. Here's how we would verify that we have uh, it working. We have some show commands. I can type show IP OSPF neighbor. And uh, from router one, of course, I should see both of my neighbors, uh, which would be router two and router three. Notice they're identified by their um, router ID. So it is helpful to use router IDs that are meaningful. Like in the case of our example, we used 1111, 2222, and 3333. That's an easy way for me to identify those, but you could also identify them by their IP addresses. And that will be the IP address that's closest to router one. So that would be the next hop IPs. And so these neighbors are in a full adjacency. So you can see the state is full. So full adjacency means they've, they've gone through the handshaking process and, and they're fully engaged as an OSPF neighbor. It also tells you the exit interface that points towards that neighbor. You can then compare this information with uh, your topology diagrams and other settings tables to ensure that you've correctly configured and cabled your network. So it's very helpful to use this as a way to verify that everything has been set up correctly. You can also type show IP protocols and this will give you uh, protocol information on the OSPF instance. So it's showing um, the different areas and the different uh, 
networks that are being advertised and it's also showing that neighbor information and it's even showing your passive interface. So really kind of a great summary of all the OSPF settings. If you type show IP OSPF, you'll notice you get very different information. It's going to tell me my uptime. So it tells me how long this OSPF instance has been running. And that can be helpful if you've had a failure where routes were not getting through and you look at the um, start time and uptime and realize that it has not been running very long. It would indicate that the process had failed or the router had rebooted or something had happened that had caused a disruption. So we like to see long numbers in the time elapsed that the uh, process has been up for a while. And then you can just see a bunch of counters. Okay, and you can type show IP OSPF interface, and this will list each interface that's uh, participating in the OSPF routing protocol. And it will give you information on each interface that uh, is directly connected there. And there's a brief version of the command, very helpful to abbreviate that information down. Again, just summarizes the interfaces that I've used network statements to advertise and it's showing those advertised networks. And the cost over there is the um, number that equates to the bandwidth, right? So a lower cost number is going to be higher bandwidth and a larger cost number is lower bandwidth, right? Lower cost numbers are preferred. And you can see that the gig interface is coming up as a one. And you know what this means. This means in this slide, they did not change the auto cost reference bandwidth. In the previous slide, they showed in the configuration changing the auto cost reference bandwidth, but that clearly has not been done here because the cost is still showing up as a one. So remember I said originally that was as low as you could go. The lowest cost would be one, and that's assigned to the gig. So a 10 gig interface would also be a one, and a 30 gig and a 100 gig would also be a one, which is why we have to modify that auto cost reference bandwidth statement so we can get those higher bandwidths counted. You'll see the auto cost reference bandwidth statement stated here again. This is a look at doing the same network that we just configured with IPv4, but doing it with IPv6. Yes, there's three versions of OSPF. There's version one, version two, and version three. Version one was for the old classful IPv4 addressing, and then version two is for the newer classless IPv4, and that's the default when you type uh, router OSPF, it goes to version two. If you want uh, version three, you can do that easily by um, configuring OSPF on the interface itself. Notice the different configuration here is instead of uh, listing your network statements under the OSPF subprompt, we go to the actual interface and we go to each interface and we tell the interface we want it to be a member of OSPF and what area we want the interface in. So it's the same command, but instead of typing it as a network statement under the router subprompt, we're going to the interface subprompt and typing it there. Then we have the same commands with a six inserted, a V6, to um, show the same information. Let's talk about network types. OSPF has a variety of network types. And this is important because OSPF will treat these networks differently in terms of the elections it holds and uh, how it um, moves information around. So and by information, I mean routing table updates. It will identify the different links between routers as point to point or broadcast multi-access, that would be all Ethernet networks or always broadcast multi-access. Point to point would be a WAN link, like when you uh, bring up a serial link, uh, the default protocol on a serial link is HDLC, and HDLC as well as PPP are point to point uh, link protocols. So it would identify those serial links that you have as point to point, it would identify your Ethernet links as um, broadcast multi-access. We also have MBMA networks, and one of these is Frame Relay. So that's a multiple access network like Ethernet, but it doesn't allow broadcasts. Multiple access, but no broadcasts. So Ethernet allows broadcasts, and Frame Relay by default does not allow broadcasts. 
So that would be an example. And we don't deal with frame relay until next term when we'll be doing CCNA4. We'll have a chapter on frame relay. Then we have point to multipoint, which is a uh, special type of NBMA network, and that's also frame relay. So you can add frame relay there. So uh, frame relay can be multi access or point to multi point. Uh, you also have virtual links, which we're not going to really cover. But their virtual link is like a VPN, and it's a way to skip over non OSPF uh, network segments and join remote OSPF routers to OSPF routers that are not directly connected neighbors. Like, uh, for example, you might at one location be connected to your ISP router. Of course, your ISP router is not running OSPF and not talking to your router in terms of routing protocols. So then at another site, you have an OSPF router and it is also connected to an ISP router with a similar setup. And you wanna join your two OSPF routers from these two remote sites together so they're seen as neighbors even though they're distant neighbors because they're connected across the internet by two ISP routers that are not participating in OSPF, you can actually connect them together as neighbors and that would be identified as a virtual link. Let's talk about some challenges. So with a multi-access network like ethernet, there are different challenges for OSPF. One of these is the adjacencies it would create. If you had multiple routers all connected to uh, a switch fabric, like an ethernet, it has to form an adjacency with each neighbor. And you can see that if it does that, it, as you add each router exponentially, the number of adjacencies increases. And so you get a um, lot of adjacencies. And so you could end up with a flooding of these link state advertisements, these event triggered updates, could create a substantial amount of network traffic if you were sending them to all of your neighbors every time there was an event, which would be the way um, other routing protocols typically behave. To solve this problem, OSPF is gonna introduce the idea of a designated router. So in every multi-access network, there will be an election and one of the routers will be uh, designated as the designated router. It will, for good measure, always try to elect a backup designated router as well. So what will happen then is the LSAs will be sent always to the designated and backup designated router only, and they will then distribute them out to the other routers. Okay. And that's that idea of a designated router and a backup designated router, which is just passive, but gets all the same LSA updates that the designated router gets and listens. And then if it does not detect the designated router acting on those LSAs, it uh, jumps in and, and takes over. The other routers are called druthers. So druthers are routers that are not DRs or BDRs. So in a multi-access segment of your network, your routers are either a DR, a BDR, or a druther. Druthers form adjacencies with the DR and BDR after the election. And two multicast addresses are used for this purpose. So druthers send their LSAs using the multicast 224006, and then the DR sends those, distributes those LSAs out to the group using 224005. So if I had an event triggered update and I was a druther, I would use 224006 to inform my DR of the event triggered update. Then my DR would turn around and send that out to the other druthers in the area using 224005 to allow all the others to know about it. This is just a really nice way to handle scalability issues with multi-access network segments. And so DR and BDR elections are only necessary on these multi-access networks. Okay, you can go in and take a look and see if your router is a designated router. You can see on each link who the designated router is. Say your router had two ethernet links, then on each ethernet link, it would list um, 
the designated and backup designated router. And of course you can just compare in this case, the designated router is 3333 and I can see this router is 1111. So it is not the DR or BDR. Okay. Then there are several types of adjacencies. You can have a full adjacency. And so a full Druther adjacency is a DR or BDR router that is fully adjacent to a non-DR or BDR router. Remember, there's three types of routers in a multi-access segment. And a full DR adjacency is a router is fully adjacent with the indicated DR neighbor. You can have a full BDR, the router is fully adjacent with the indicated BDR neighbor. You can have a two-way Druther, the non-DR or BDR router has a neighbor adjacency with another non-DR or BDR router. Your book has some excellent examples of each of these. We can talk about the election process. So the router with the highest interface priority is elected as the DR. You can change the interface priority number. It is uh, set by default and you can always uh, change that to throw the election. The router with the second highest interface priority is elected as the BDR. And if you set a priority of zero, that router cannot become the DR. If the interface priorities are equal, which they will be because they're all um, by default set to the same number, then the router with the highest router ID, and that's why it's important to have these unique router IDs. Whoever you set with the highest router ID will be elected as the DR, and the second highest router ID will be the BDR. And then we can talk about the three ways that a router ID is determined again. This is a review of what I covered in a previous slide. The router ID can be manually configured, which is the preferred with the router ID command. If you don't do that, OSPF will determine the router ID using the highest loopback IPv4 address. It's important here to note it has to be an IPv4 address because the router ID is a 32-bit number, so an IPv6 address cannot be used. So if you had a loopback interface, but it was an IPv6 loopback, it would not be able to serve as the router ID. But if you have any IPv4 loopback interfaces, the highest numbered IPv4 address would be used as your, loop, as your um, router ID. If you don't have any loopbacks, the router ID will be determined by a highest active IPv4 address on a real interface. And so an interface, unfortunately, that is shut down does not qualify. So if you had real interfaces, but they weren't turned up yet, they were still in shutdown, then your IPv6, uh, sorry, your um, OSPF protocol will fail and you'll get a, a system message to that effect. An easy way to do that is set up OSPF, go into a, a blank router, and before you configure your interfaces with IPs, go in and you know type router OSPF1 and then uh, you should get the failure right about then actually because it will try to immediately, as soon as you go into the subprompt, it will try to start up the OSPF um, process. And you should get a system message pretty quickly that says OSPF has failed, uh, no router ID determined. And so, you know, once you manually configure the ID or put an IP on an interface, then OSPF will work again, but you'll have to uh, do some action. So if you want to see it in action, you can try that. Let's talk about the election process again. The DR, once it's been elected, is gonna remain the DR until it either fails or the OSPF process fails or is stopped, right? The multi-access interface on the DR fails or is shut down. In other words, the DR becomes unreachable. So it's pretty simply stated, either the DR router is power cycled or freezes up or the cable falls out, something of that nature. If it becomes unavailable, uh, the DR will lose its uh, role as DR and the BDR will automatically be promoted. And immediately a new BDR is elected. And then they don't actually go back. So once this election's happened, if the DR were to rejoin the network segment, it would just be a druther. It wouldn't uh, regain its role 
the OSPF priority, instead of setting the router ID on all routers, it is better to, well, you do want to, let's restate this. You do want to set the router ID on all routers, but you can control the election better by also setting the priority on the port. So you can see that as an example here, if I type IPOSPF priority on this port, this guy is going to win the election. And so with a priority of 255, it's going to win the election. Similarly, if you did not want a router to be the DR for a network segment, you could type IPOSPF priority zero, and it would be unable to serve as the DR. And this is the command to reset the process, clear IPOSPF process, will clear these elections and force uh, a, new, a new election. Of course, you have to do that on all routers. So um, propagating a default static route in OSPF v2. So in v2, we can propagate a static route, which remember, we're always going to have a static route when we have a non-OSPF network. Classically, that would be our connection to the internet, as shown here with the loopback, which is, you know, just uh, there as a, as a fake internet connection, but it could be a real connection like a serial interface or a gig interface. So we have some connection to a non-OSPF network and we want to propagate that within OSPF. We first create a route to this non-OSPF network. You can see that there with the quad zero route to the 209.165.200.226, which is the next top IP in that network. And then we go into our OSPF process and we type default information originate. This says take the default route and redistribute it as an OSPF route. And so it will tell all the other OSPF routers about this default route. So they will also have um, a deep know about this default non-OSPF network and it will be the default, which means if you can't figure out where to send it, you'll send it there. So if there's no other network, that would be no OSPF network, or if you're running other routing protocols or have other static routes, if you go down the routing table list, you can't find where the packet goes, you would send it here. This is the catch-all. Sometimes it's called the route of last resort, and you can see that here, the gateway of last resort. So default sometimes makes you think like it's the first, right? So that's why we sometimes call it the router gateway of last resort, because it, it is the last one considered. It's ironically listed first in the table, but it's the last one. Now this is how you would do the same thing with IPv6. Of course, a default route in IPv6 is just colon colon slash zero because the double colons are 128 zeros with a slash zero mask. So that's the equivalent of the quad zero route. And then you would point it to the next top IP. So that's your static route. And then you would just type the same command, default information originate that we get um, transmitted throughout your network. The OSPF hello and dead intervals must match or a neighbor adjacency will not occur. So by match, we don't mean that the hello and dead intervals are the same. See that hello is 10 and dead is 40. Dead interval is always going to be higher than the hello interval. The dead interval says how many hellos you can miss before the neighbor is considered dead. <coughs> Once a neighbor is considered dead, all the routes learned from that neighbor must, must be marked as unreachable until you get a hello from that neighbor again. So it's important to have the dead interval some multiple of the hello interval. In this case, it's four times higher. What it's saying by the must match, they must match between routers, meaning that router one's hello interval and router one's dead interval need to be the same as the ones on router two and router three. You need uh, adjacent neighbors to have the same hello and dead intervals. You can imagine how confusing it would be if I'm sending you hellos every 10 seconds and you're sending me them every seven and I mark you as dead after 40 and you mark me as dead after 30, it would create all kinds of um, inconsistencies in how we communicate. So it's very important that the neighbor expectations on how often we say hello and how many hellos I can miss before I'm determined as unreliable. So that those are very important counters. Uh, it's always recommended to not mess with them. These are the defaults shown here. Just leave them the default intervals.
Here's how you modify them if you want to mess around. So if you wanted to mess around with them, you can certainly do that. There are times when we do want to change the intervals. Say that we have a, a, an unreliable connection, for instance. So if I have an unreliable connection, I might want to push the dead interval up further, allowing more of the hellos to be missed. So if I have a high packet loss situation, um, maybe on a dial-up connection or some type of unreliable connection where we have a high error rate, I might want to create a dead interval that's higher. Also, there may be times when I want to um, shrink the hello interval down and make it, make it more frequent, where we are having to say hello um, faster, more frequently, and uh, making those links dead in, in a quicker way, which is what they're illustrating here. Secure routing updates. Okay, well, routing updates are pretty vulnerable to hackers, right? Both from uh, hackers being able to hear them, um, we can solve some of that with that passive interface command, but hackers also can inject routes by sending fake OSPF routing table updates to a router from, say, a laptop. And so that's the default is null, which is no authentication, which means if we get a routing table update, assume it's from a neighbor, right? So I can send fake uh, neighbor routing table updates to a router and it will add those routes into its table and I could redirect traffic anywhere I want it to go. And this actually happens um, and you can prevent it by just setting up a password. And of course, um, we would recommend using MD5 authentication instead of a plain text password. So with the MD5 authentication, you have the routing table encrypted. So if a hacker were to get a hold of that table, because maybe you forgot the passive interface command or they're on a network segment um, where routing tables need to travel because there's other routers, if they're listening, they will see the updates, but they won't be able to understand them because they will be garbled up with a secret key. And they would need that key to be able to unlock the um, message. Similarly then, of course, they wouldn't be able to send their own because they wouldn't have the key to encrypt them. So we wouldn't be able to, you know, decrypt them correctly. So they'd never get added to our table. So it's a pretty easy thing to configure. You have a lab where you'll do it. I won't go through the steps here, but you can notice here are two options, which I'll point out. You could do it globally with one key that you use on all your interfaces, meaning that all the neighbors for this router would use the same key. But I could also configure it on a per interface basis if I wanted to have different password keys for different neighbors. So um, that sometimes uh, could be useful. Okay, so we're going to look at doing it at setting up a key. This is doing it per interface. And uh, of course, even though they're doing it per interface, they uh, in this example, we're setting all the keys to the same value. So they might as well have done this one globally, yes. So uh, the only advantage to doing it per interface like this is if you're going to use different keys, of course. And you'll see that as soon as you do this, you'll lose your neighbor adjacencies until, of course, you set this message on the other side. And once the message digest keys are set and they match, then you should, should see system messages come uh, notifying you that those adjacencies have been restored. Okay. And you can, of course, take a look at that as part of your OSPF interface command. You can see what key you're using and that you've um, you know, got authentication enabled. And, and of course, proof is in the pudding. Look at the route table, right? You should be getting routes from your neighbors. If you're not seeing little O's there on the left, then something's wrong. You're not receiving OSPF um, routes. Let's talk about troubleshooting single area OSPF implementations. So one problem can occur at the beginning when you're forming adjacencies. In fact, this is the most likely place you'll find problems is just getting it going, right? If you're going to have problems, they happen during this initial adjacency period. And, you know, that can happen because the interfaces are not on the same network. For instance, you might have a bad IP address where 
Uh, they could both have the same IP or the IP addresses could be in different subnets. And so that's preventing uh, communication. You can easily verify that just by trying to ping your neighbor. It's always a good idea to have tested that, right? Uh, also, you could have something going on where they have bad subnet masks that sometimes can cause them, even though they have valid IPs, the masks are different and it causes them to appear like they're in different networks and they refuse to communicate. So that would be the first thing I'd look at is are the interfaces really on the same network? And in the case of a multi-access network, maybe someone did something with the switch and they're in different VLANs. So they appear to be on the same multi-access network, but they may actually be sitting in different VLANs. You may have different OSPF network types, right? So we talked about the network types like the point-to-point -point and the multi-access. And so it could be that the two routers are, are misdetecting the network type. So one is uh, misidentifying it as a different type of network. You could be that the OSPF hello and dead uh, timers do not match from router one to router two, and that can cause those adjacency problems. Or it can cause, if they don't match, it can cause the adjacency to go up and down, to go up and down, go up and down. That's more typically what you see. Interface or neighbor is incorrectly configured as passive, right? So if you put a passive interface command on that interface, it's not going to send its routing tables or um, hellos. And so if I had that on router one, then router two would be trying to form an adjacency and router one would be ignoring it because I had the passive interface command. So that sometimes we get a little carried away when we cut and paste and we might put the passive interface command on too many of our interfaces. We might also have a missing or incorrect network command. We might have, for instance, left out the network command for this network. And so that would tell OSPF that you didn't want it to uh, include that network in OSPF. So it would not form an adjacency with the, with the neighbor router. And finally, of course, authentication could be misconfigured where you don't have a matching password on both sides, or you've only set up authentication on one side and not on the other. All right, and so this basically shows the um, status to go from a down state to a full state. So they always start in a down state and then they try to initialize um, and that's where they send hellos and they say, hi neighbor, want to form an adjacency? And once an adjacency is formed, they move to the two-way state because they both have acknowledged, they say, yeah, I'll, I'll share information if you will, okay, great. Then they move on to synchronizing their database. So they start sending and exchanging uh, those LSAs until they both have a um, comprehensive uh, view of the network. And we call that convergence or being converged when they both have uh, loaded all of the LSAs into their database and have the same view. At that point, they're said to be in a full state and you would see that in the show commands where it would say full. And this happens very fast. It's hard to catch them in one of the other states because they do converge, especially in the lab where we have so few networks for them to share. They have converged before you could ever type a show command to see that they were in process of converging. Here's the troubleshooting commands and we looked at all of these before. They're not showing the clear one, but I occasionally clear the OSPF um, process so that Oh, it is at the bottom there, sorry. Clear IP OSPF process. So you'd put like clear IP OSPF 10 or one or whatever the process ID is. And that'll reset all the adjacencies. It dumps all the, it basically restarts the OSPF process, causing it to dump all of its routes, all of its adjacencies and basically start over fresh. And so often if I'm having some problems, I'll just go in all the routers uh, that are having problems and just clear the OSPF process. It's kind of like rebooting the router, but it's faster. It's almost instant. This is just a flow chart to show you kind of how you might troubleshoot at different uh, points, right? So, you know, is the neighbor table correct? If it's not correct, so if you have two neighbors and it only shows one, you need to troubleshoot that. So once you have all the neighbors, then you do the show command on the routing table. Do you see all the routes you expected to? You should see little O's for all the destination networks that you expected to learn about. And if that's not showing up, then you want to troubleshoot. And then finally, do a trace route and look at the trace and see, is that following the right hop path? Are those hopping through the right routers? Is that how you expected traffic to travel through the network? 
If you're like, why is the traffic going over here? I thought it would take this other route. You need to troubleshoot that. So those are kind of the three points at which you might investigate your network to verify that things are working and also to, um, to maybe begin troubleshooting if you need to. So neighbor issues, we already kind of talked about those and how they could be related to things like passive interface or timers. And routing table issues, that might be a missing network statement, right? Quite often it would be a, a network statement like shown here that's uh, just missing or wrong. You might have assigned it to the wrong area, for instance. You might have uh, fat fingered a one in there and put an area 10, even though we're doing single area, so they should all be in area zero. And the commands are really the same for OSPF version three. So in summary, we learned about the different types of OSPF network links between the routers. We also learned about what the DR and BDR are and why they're there and how they're elected. And we learned about setting port priority numbers and how those override the ID. We also talked about propagating a default static route through OSPF. We also talked a lot about the different intervals and the cost reference bandwidth that's used to evaluate the bandwidth of different interfaces and how you want to update that to accommodate the new faster interfaces. Okay. And by the way, that final one we had looked at where you do troubleshooting if it's not taking the right path through the network, that likely is because of that auto cost reference or a cost reference is out of, like say you forgot to do that on, on a, one of your routers and it had a 10 gig link, it would see the 10 gig and the one gig is equal. And so it might, it might choose the one gig link uh, in some cases over the 10 gig because it really sees them as an equal cost or it might be load balancing. Imagine that you have a 10 gig and a backup one gig link to a destination and that router load balances the traffic across those. That's really not an effective use. You really wanted that traffic to take the higher bandwidth path. And so you can see all that happening when you do that trace route and then you can troubleshoot why is it behaving this way. And oftentimes it's because it, it is misinterpreting the bandwidth of those interfaces in terms of the cost reference. Thank you for your time. We'll see you next week for chapter six.